This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, the car show. Drive in anxious and cruise out confident. With the best automotive information for your vehicle, Bumper to Bumper, helping you and your car feel better. And now your hosts, Matt Allen and Dave Riccio. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are your KTAR car guys. Heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we're helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we've got answers, so we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You can also get a hold of the show by texting us at 411 923 Again, 411-923. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, we've got an email of the week. (laughs) What's so funny, Dave? (laughs) You. I'm glad you could join us today. (laughs) Open phones and different types of auto repairs. Can I influence the type of auto repairs I get in my car? Sometimes I go in for a repair on my car and they fix it that day, that afternoon. It's all done. Other times I take it in and I get the car for like two and three and four days and they're trying to figure out... What the heck is the difference between all these auto repairs that I'm getting in the auto shop? Why sometimes is it no big deal? It's maybe expensive, but it's fixed pretty quick, and sometimes it's there for four days and nothing happens, it feels like. I had a car like that at my (laughs) shop. (laughs) With nothing happening, right? Right? Well, I mean, I I think that uh, there's all these different, like you say, there's different types of repairs, and and they take different amounts of time to do, different consideration, different thoughts. and and, Different skill levels of the technician. Skill sets, yeah. So... You might get a stack of certain kind of cars or certain kind of problems lined up, and you've got to have a technician to do them. But then sometimes, you know, you go in for normal maintenance, preventative services and stuff. That's fairly easy work. It's very predictable, I should say, not necessarily easy. And uh, it's in and out in the day. (coughs) But then the other repairs are when you have a problem, maybe this intermittent thing going on, and, and it takes some time and and you can only go in there and test for so long, maybe before you get a little blender brain. You, well, know, you start looking at diagrams and all these different things. That takes longer. But we can influence those types of – the diff- we've kind of broken it down, what, Dave? Three different kind of categories, if you will. Yeah, so you might go into the shop. Let's just take the two extremes. There's preventative maintenance stuff. That's going to be things like fluids and you know spark plugs or things that are prescribed at a certain mileage. Timing belts are things that are prescribed for your car to certain mileage. I, I There's just, nothing to figure out. Yeah, the stuff in the book. Pretty brain, well, not brainless, I should say like that. But, the, you know, just normal. You know it's coming. You expect it because you've read the owner's manual and, and you understand that certain things are supposed to happen during mileage intervals or time intervals. And, and like you said, you it's... You look at it like an oil change. Everyone knows they need to get an oil change. Everyone knows that, well... Tire transmission rotation. needs to be, you know, right. changed. Transmission fluid, radiator fluid, spark plugs get changed. Or we hope everybody knows that. That's why we're talking about it. Mm-hmm. But there's things that are just regular prescribed. You know, you're you're 50 years old. You're going to go in for a colonoscopy <laughs> in the hua. <laughs> but it's not something you worry about at, the, at 30 years old. It's not right. a, not really on the radar as of yet. So then we have the extreme from the preventive maintenance. Then we'll go all the way to the extreme of breakdown or catastrophic failure. And those are the types of things like maybe a belt or a hose or a radiator uh, blew up or, or just something happened that rendered the car broken down, an alternator, a belt, uh, you know, maybe just running so badly. What are the kind of things really break down? You could have a bearing failure, I guess, or drive shaft or starter goes bad, alternator. Maybe you said that. Yeah, I mean, those things you can't really predict necessarily. I don't know. We're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right. You're a big deal, right? Yeah. We have so, so those are the two extremes, preventive maintenance and the breakdown. And then there's the stuff in the middle, the symptoms. Well, let's, let's talk about breakdown because what is your expectation when you go to the shop? Well, when you bring your car to the shop or it shows up on a tow truck, well, we look at it and we, we see some water or coolant that's coming out of the water pump. Well, we're going to fill it up with fluid and we're going to pressure test it to see where all the leaks are in the cooling system. It's pretty obvious. You know, you pump it up. A lot of times it's obvious, and you see, like, water squirting outside of the water pump. Hey, we know we have a bad water pump. There's no real 
in-depth diagnostic. There's no charts. There's no this or that. You can just see it. It's just broken. It's like the emergency room, I guess. There's a difference. I mean, you walk into the emergency room with a butcher knife sticking out of your, you know, your chest. It's pretty obvious. I mean, they know there's going to be some damage in there, and that that's going to be some delicate work. But that might be a little bit different than going in, going. Ah, I got this thing over here. Mm. It's not quite. I can't describe it well, but it hurts. That's different than than a catastrophic failure or breakdown. So we've talked about the the two extremes: preventative maintenance, fluids, stuff that you regularly do. It's in the book. It's prescribed. It's not s- surprising, and it's not stuff that's urgent. Now we got mechanical breakdown where your car ain't gonna go nowhere until ain't you gonna <laughs> go nowhere <laughs> until you get it fixed. Ding ding, Davey. <laughs> and in the middle, I'm gonna call these drivability problems. And drivability problems, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make it a big drivability problem issue. So some people used to think, well, drivability is just engine related issues. I'm gonna call drivability problems are things you gotta drive and figure out. You can't just diagnose it in the bay. Someone's gotta drive it and figure it out. And they're not always easy. So I call some are just code diagnoses. Sometimes we gotta diagnose cars or we don't have any codes. It's gonna take some seat of the pants feel. It's going to take a ton of experience, but I got to go figure it out. And it could be something like, you know, running rough or sputters every now and then, or the check engine light comes on every now and then. But it's, it's, it takes a lot of uh, brain experience, experience, thought and, process. Exactly. Intuition, maybe. Intuition, Just... uh, intellectual property. I'll call it that, you know, because you can, you can take, you know, five technicians and, you know, one in the five has that skill, you know, and and we know in our shops which guys are. Oh, that's a hard drivability issue that goes over to his his ticket, his hook, mm-hmm. you know. And this one over here, you know, that's kind of a, a lighter a lighter thing, and it's just preventative maintenance. And we can really use a different a different type of guy to look at that. So, but the expectation is different. So your car came off the tow truck. The guy put a pressure tester on it. He pumped up your cooling system, and he saw a leak squirting out of the side of the car. Chances are you're going to get a water pump, a timing belt, and your car's going to be ready that next afternoon. Not a big deal. And then you say, hey, I've got this one weird problem. It's symptom-related when it's drivability. And you've got to give the shop some more time with it, especially if it's intermittent and especially if you can only make it happen every now and then. Like, hey, this happens one time every five days. That's a question we like to ask. What is the frequency of occurrence? Because that helps us know... Because in, in, until, until we feel it, it's going to be hard for us to tell you what's wrong with your car. And customers get frustrated. Well, that's what you do. You should just know that. No, no, it's not just what we do. We can't read minds. And if you went to the doctor's office and just sit there with a smug look on your face, all he's going to know is you've got a bad attitude. But he's not, <laughs> Wow, Dave. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> he's not going to know that you know, you're really, you're really uh, having a, some sort of flare-up somewhere in your body, you know. Unless it's real obvious and you can see it. So, you know, that's where the shop has to experience the problem to really know what's going on. And, and sometimes they say, well, you know, we can't, we can't fix it if we – it doesn't happen for us. Well, I talk to some shop owners and people will describe their problem and they say, well, okay, what's going to be – maybe it's just the way we say it, but they'll take it literal. Well, it would be about – probably be $150 to look at it. You mean you're just going to charge me $150 to look at it? Or a hunt, make up the number. It doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes I, I mean, I've said to a customer before, I'm not pulling up a lounge chair and just sitting down and standing and looking at the car and charging hundred fifty dollars to look at your car. We have to go through a process of testing and analyzing, taking that information, going through books, looking in, in, in wiring diagrams, and and uh, it can get complicated and take some time. Well, the car that we have in my shop right now came from the tire shop from down the street, and they referred it over to us, and they said it's got a transmission problem. We drove it. And my technician looked at the codes, and there was a code in there for a cylinder number three misfire. There was broken mounts in the car, and so we just called the tire shop, and I said, we're just going to refer it back to you because we think it has an engine problem, not a transmission problem. Well, they put a couple mounts in it, cleared the code. The code didn't come back, and they said it still has a transmission problem. So it's back and forth and back and forth between the transmission shop and the in the uh, tire shop. And so we drove it again the second time. Well, there's no codes, and we can tell it's definitely misfiring, but... It, it's not showing up on the data. It's not showing up on the scanner. But our experience says, well, hey, we got to start pulling spark plugs out of this thing, see if we can see some carbon tracking on it, see if we've got a coil that's maybe breaking down. We don't know what's going on, but that's where the experience and the taking stuff apart and looking at stuff starts to come into play. And there may not be any silver bullet. 
at one point we may just look at it, and it's 120,000 miles, and the spark plug should have been replaced 20,000 miles earlier. We may need to catch it up on, on on some of that preventative maintenance that got skipped first. Well, and I like to call that cumulative wear. There's not one particular thing that's wrong with the car. You can't say, it's the spark plugs, it's the coil. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and that single repair still wouldn't take care of the problem. It's the totality of all those things. And I think our point when we started this, Dave, and we'll probably have to go on it some more in the next segment, is you can influence that. If you do your PM work, your preventative maintenance, you're going to avoid probably having breakdowns, and you're going to maybe avoid having some of these other symptom-based problems where you actually have to pay someone to figure the problem out where the breakdown is much easier. But we can... We can get to that. When we come back, we got wide open lines at 602 277 5827. You can also text us at 411 923. You're listening to Matt and Dave and Bumper to Bumper Radio. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 923 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and we are helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience every Saturday from 11 to noon. And I'm just looking, and we got a few texts here that came on uh, during this last segment. And one here that I kind of keyed on, it. I have a 2013 Ford Raptor. By installing an aftermarket bumper and skid plate, will that void my warranty? And I say no. It only voids it as opposed to what's related to it. So, you know what, there's going to be no warranty on the bumper mounting brackets because we, we address that. You know, or if you put aftermarket shocks on it, well, you're, you know, it's going to affect suspension-related items, but that's not going to affect something up in the engine compartment necessarily. Well, these warranty companies and even some of the dealers like to hang their hat on, oh, you lifted the truck, it's going to avoid uh, your warranty. Oh, you know, I wasn't thinking about that. The factory warranty, no. Aftermarket warranty, Yes, I've seen those guys get out a lot of warranty stuff. Well, not on a not on a bumper or something like that, mm. but they're pretty sketchy. They'll they'll always look for something. But you know, I had a a Chevy Duramax truck and I had a chip on it and it was lifted and and you know it was the big diesel. And he was uh, compensating for something. Yeah, <laughs> and I never had one before. I wanted one, <laughs> but uh, so it was running bad and it had a bad wiring harness and it was a known problem on this truck. They just the Duramax truck. They had the injector wiring harnesses would go bad, and I had it at the local Chevy dealer under warranty. And they said, "Oh, you put a chip in and this truck is lifted. You voided the warranty. What are you talking about? It's got nothing to do with anything. I mean, yeah, I go get a pedicure and and now I have a toothache. So that's the the fault of of what? It has nothing to do with anything. Unless you suck your toes. <laughs> well, sometimes I chew my toenails. No, I, I can only wish to be that limber. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it doesn't it doesn't really have anything to do with it. Now, if you lift the truck and you have a bad drive shaft, you could argue that the drive line angle was changed and that tore up mm-hmm. the U joints or something. But typically not. Right. So only really on the factory warranty what it affects. But I've seen you know. On these aftermarket warranties, a guy's in my par- his car's in my parking lot. He's got a bad transmission, and he went from a 16-inch wheel to an 18-inch wheel. The overall size of the tire is the same because there's you know the rolling. You yeah. you, you can change the the sidewall height to to give you the same tire size, and they said no, we're not going to cover it because you changed the tire size. So, and I've had that happen more than once, and they send out these inspectors from the warranty companies, and the first thing they do is open up the door jam check the size of the tire, and go back. Because their their whole thing is to, why don't we have to warranty this car? Yeah, that, they're kind of sleazy. I mean, they're... Uh, Some of them, yeah, a good majority yeah. of them are kind of sleazy. <laughs> well, and that could, if, you know, we didn't mean to go this way, but we're going there now, Dave, with, just with that question. But that's where the preventative maintenance comes in. Because what's the other thing that these warranty guys doing when they send out an inspector? It has nothing to do... We're talking about maybe a wheel hub bearing or a axle shaft or something like that but what are they doing when they come out they're checking the motor oil they're checking the transmission fluid they're checking all the fluids and they're checking things to see if there's a way that they can say hey that's dirty and you haven't been taking care of that so we're noting this so that we don't have to warranty the next thing because you've neglected the car now well i've seen them turn down because of lack of maintenance on a vehicle i've seen them turn down a repair and say, you know, this vehicle is just not properly maintained, so we're not. So yeah. that's that. You're going to get me on a big old rant, rant rave on this aftermarket warranties because, you know, there is a there is a few good ones, but I would say they're the minority. 
uh, the my majority of them tend to just want to, you know, they're in the business, hey, if we can sell these warranties, we collect all this money up front, but whatever we don't have to fix, you know, that's money in our pocket. So it's in their best interest not to take care of you. Now, Ford Motor Company sells you a car. They have a little different agenda as far as taking care of you, taking care of their brand. I mean, there's a brand that they that has a brand name. The warranty company? Taking care less. You know, Auto Repair USA, you know, who, who the heck are they? You know, but, but Ford has a name to protect. So they, get, they want to take care of their customers. You're getting antsy over there. No, I'm just bouncing around a little bit, you know. <laughs> just well, we got doing some more, my thing. <laughs> we got some more phone calls, but we're going to go ahead and uh, get to some of these phone calls. We've got Juan in Avondale on an 01 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Juan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you for taking my call. I'm just having um, um, an issue with my uh, instrument panel light. They're not coming on at all, so at night I can't see anything. And the instrument panel lights, and I was wondering. I already checked all the fuses. I was wondering what what else I can check. Are there any other lights that went off? One does the stereo light, you know, like the clock. Can you still dim that bright up and down uh, with the dimmer switch? Yeah, when I go, I mean, when I go with the dimmer switch all the way up, when I click it all the way up, yeah, I can. The instrument panel light comes on. And the, the, you can see the radio clock and the radio, you know, the stations and all. You can see that. But once I click it down, it all, it all, it all goes off. Everything goes off. Hmm. Even the radio, too, right? Even the radio, too. Okay. Even the light on the radio. Can't make out the numbers or anything. Hmm. That's weird, Dave. I'm not sure. We might have to do a little bit of research on that. But it, it, um, it, it sounds... Oop. Juan, hold on one <laughs> second. I cut you off a little bit early. What were you saying? I haven't done anything to it. I haven't added a radio or nothing to it at all. Okay. Well, that that's good to know. I mean, that's one piece of information. I guess I might be looking at the headlight switch itself because that's, that's the dimmer switch is built into that. Um, the, that dimmer switch should also be able to control the radio. When you turn it up or turn it bright, it's going to turn on the dome lights and should be at full volume, if you will, or full brightness. Maybe you'd be looking at a dimmer switch. I know there is a separate fuse. It's usually a 7.5 amp fuse. Really, 7.5? It is, 7.5 <laughs> amp fuse for the for the dash lights. And But GM, in that in that vintage of Tahoe 2001, they had a lot of, of issues with the instrument clusters, so that could be it too. Really, this is a case where someone, you need to get the roadmap out. And to me, the diagram. roadmap is the wiring diagram. And what are we missing? At what intersection is there supposed to be power, and is it there? So... I, uh, a short of, if you want to guess one, headlight switch. Other than I that, I call that a wag, wild a guess. <laughs> you know, if you want to go wa- with a wag, I would say dimmer switch. Yeah, that would be my guess. <laughs> so, I guess so too. <laughs> thanks for the call, Juan. We had another text here. Uh, the gentleman has a uh, 1999 Toyota Camry, and he says there's two uh, drain plugs, one for the differential. And then one for the transmission. He's asking, is there also two separate fills? Absolutely, there's two separate fills. On the Toyotas, they'll use gear oil in the differential part of the transmission. Not on all models, just on some of them. And uh, so it's it's just like a differential on a car. So you drain it in a different fill. And then the transmission fluid or the hydraulic fluid is a different section of the transmission. So some transmissions don't do that, but Toyota is well known for doing that. And before you dig into doing that transaxle or the the differential portion of the service there, that's not difficult to do because those bottles don't fit right. It is a messy disaster. So before you tackle it, make sure you've got the right little pump and all that stuff. And that may be something just better for the shop to do. When we come back, we're taking more phone calls at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Matt and Dave on Bumper to Bumper Radio. News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Dave Riccio. He's Matt Allen. We are your KTAR car guys heard here every Saturday from 11 to noon, and we're trying to help you have a better understanding of auto repair so that it is not a point of stress in your life. It's not something, it's no drama, i got to go deal with the auto shop, and I hate the auto shop, and I always feel like they're selling me something I don't need. We're going to tell you what you do need so that when you hear about it, you're not like, oh my goodness. It's not a point of stress, what the expectation should be, because I find people are unhappy because they have a conflict in expectations. 
that's a lot what it is. I mean, really, it's just aligning the expectations in, it, in advance, really. Hey, we do have a text here, and I know you already answered the text there with the keyboard, Matt, but it was uh, a gentleman had a Honda Element 60,000 miles, and he said, uh, you said something about serpentine belt and 100,000 miles. We talked about a timing belt, but he specifically in his text said serpentine belt. Those are two totally different things, uh, and I'm just bringing that up because sometimes you hear us talking about stuff, and it, it may seem like a little nuance, but a serpentine belt is something you can see just by opening the hood. A timing belt is something you can see by taking quite a bit of the front of the engine apart. So the timing belt is a thing where we do it based on it's a, it's mileage. It's got a pre-prescribed mileage or time interval, yes. In a serpentine belt, we can check it out. We've got a little tool to measure how much tread is left on the timing or on the serpentine belt. Yeah. See, I even confused myself right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> Easy to do sometimes, huh, Dave? <laughs> and uh, on, on the serpentine belts, too... <laughs> Lately, uh, the the material of the belt has changed. So it used to be we'd be looking for cracks in the belt. And we've had this a couple of times at my shop. We tell someone they need a belt, and maybe their husband or their neighbor looks at the car, and they, then we get the phone call. What are you talking about? There's no cracks or anything. Well, the belts don't crack necessarily now. They just wear out. They're like a tire. They just wear. The material goes away. And, and that's the tool that Dave was mentioning where we actually measure the depth of the grooves on the belt. You didn't weren't doing that five years ago. It's changing. And for those of you who just tuned in the show, Matt and I uh, own auto shops. I own a transmission shop in Tempe, Arizona, and Matt owns Virginia Auto Service. Mine is Tri City Transmission, and he's in Central Phoenix. But we are among a list of you know twenty five other shops that whether this be body shops or general repair shops, transmission shops. They can all be found at bumper to bumper radio.com. And these are a list of shops that we just know are great shops. You're not gonna have any problems. They're not they're not chains, big chain names, but these are these are shops where the owner is on site. And I wanted to highlight one of the body shops, uh, I seventeen collision, because Kevin is such a good guy and they do such nice work and it's so easy to refer people up there. Well, yeah, I mean the story for Kevin and I goes back before I Opened my shop. I had never been. I didn't know where Virginia was. I used to live in the state of Virginia. I didn't know there was a street named Virginia. Little did I know it was just south of Thomas on Seventh Street. And uh, but I was a tech at Camelback Porsche, and uh, which is no longer there. That's the that's the BMW used car store now. So I was a technician there after a short stint working with the Porsche racing team, and uh, I was unemployed. They closed down. It was consolidated. Roger Penske bought it out, shut it down, moved it to Scottsdale. Low man on the totem pole. I had no job, and voila, bought the shop. Well, Kevin from I-17 ran worked with the body shop that we, that the Porsche dealer sent the work to. And so he left there and went out on his own. That's the only guy that I've really ever referred work to in almost nearly 20 years of, at Virginia Auto Service. And uh, I want to give him a special thanks and a little shout-out because he did some work on my car. We did a lot of work. My wife has a nice little BMW station wagon. It's a 2006, 80,000 miles. We started talking about some of these cumulative repairs. It had a lot of little things on the car, but nothing was wrong. So we went through. We're keeping the car a long time. We've got to. And, uh, you know, tires and struts and shocks. But, boy, that car really made a transformation from really having nothing necessarily wrong with it Several thousand miles or dollars later with all this work that we did, the car is a dream now. So I took it over to Kevin I-17. Let's paint the hood, take care of these door dings, take care of this. Here's the car, Kevin. You know, they had it for a week and a half. No problem. I'll tell you what. The car, my wife is happy. It's a brand new car. And I didn't have to spend sixty grand to get one. A couple grand on some paint work few thousand dollars in the shop on shocks and struts and some wiring repairs it's like a new car it's just like a new car so i-17 collision if you have a body one day you'll need a body shop oh so it's just, just a matter of when it's just you a know. matter of when so write down in your glove box put it in your smartphone i-17 collision 602-249-1706 there you go well, and if you find any of these shops at bumper to bumper radiocom these are not shops that just called us and we just put on the list. I mean, that's a 20-year relationship that Matt has. Knows him, trusts him. You know, I go out to lunch with Kevin. He's one of my favorite people. And uh, so pretty much everybody on that list at bumper to bumper radio is a great shop. Kevin's a rock star, too. <laughs> he, literally. A, he plays in a, a <laughs> rock and roll band. And his wife, Sherry Rowe, just signed a country music contract. She's a singer and he travels around and plays in that band and it's really cool he's a really good guy so 
Anyway. Well, up versus this segment, we're going to go with Lee in Apache Junction on a 1992 Ford Taurus wagon. Go ahead, Lee. Bumper to Bumper Radio. What can we help you with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, last night, I'll, I lost uh, power steering. I lost the fluid. have no power steering. I have a new serpentine belt, a new rack and pinion, a new high-pressure line, a new pump. Should I drive it 10 miles to my mechanic? It's got no fluid in it at all. That's correct, and I've got a lot. I had lots of smoke when I got to where I was going. I had lots of smoke under the hood, which tells me that there's a leak down onto something hot. The question is, should I drive it without power steering on a serpentine belt? No, I wouldn't drive it because a, um, if if there's something that the shop did and it lost the fluid, well, maybe they should be on the hook for the tow. We don't know that. So if the shop is the one that did all this work, I would consult with them, have them help you make that decision. But to me, that's no. If you've got towing road service or something, you should try and use that. Once the car gets back to the shop, then if somebody had to actually pay for this tow bill, then we'll decide, is there somebody that's responsible? Is it you? Is it a different repair? Or are they on the hook for it? But what you don't want to do is have them do a repair and they say, well, I just wanted to drive it down. It lost all this fluid. Then you just ruined, you know, you burned up a pump that maybe wasn't a problem and you mm. created. In worst case, you said you got some smoke. That power probably not likely to happen. You don't want power steering fluid to go on the exhaust. Now you got a barbecue. <laughs> barbecue. <laughs> yeah, it's so not good. So for a hundred dollar tow bill, just just to get it towed. Well, you know, and we're talking about towing, and people, you know, should I drive it? Shouldn't I drive it? Should I pay for the towing? Shouldn't I pay for the towing? When you call and you set up your insurance policy for the next year for an extra ten, maybe fifteen dollars, you can have towing for the year. And you don't have to go to the big motor club, but it's something you can have with your regular insurance company. I've had the same insurance company, USAA, for, I don't know, since I could drive. Take that ABC (laughs) card and throw it in the trash. Get your road service at GEICO or USAA or or get it on your insurance policy. And uh, And it's two bucks a month. Two two bucks a month, and then you don't have to worry about that. And I see people flat-towing cars. They use a tow strap, and they're, they're towing it, and I'm thinking... Gosh, we're saving on a hundred dollar tow, but we're looking at some big money if it goes wrong. We're gonna go with Pete in Scottsdale on a 2014 Porsche. I can hardly say it. Cayman. Porsche Cayman. Go ahead, Cayman. Pete. <laughs> Pete, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi, guys. Good morning. Thanks morning. for taking my call. Uh, my question is uh, mostly like a second opinion for me, uh, not a repair. But if I if I could get a second opinion, I would greatly appreciate it. I have a, a brand new uh, Porsche 2014 that it literally came off the showroom. But I have, I'm having a situation where uh, when I back the car out of the uh, my garage and cut the wheel to get out of my driveway. The wheel feels like it's going to kind of like fall off, like it's bumping, like I'm hitting a curb or something like that. And according to the dealer, that is perfectly normal, and it's, it, it does that like, you know, in all Porsches basically across the board. And I, I, I find it hard to believe that that's the case on a car like that, or there's nothing that it could be done about it because that's the way that the car was made. Now, uh, me. So, uh, what, what, what is your thought on that? I need to ask you one more time. So, when you t- are you turning the wheel to a full lock position, like all the way, or uh, tell me one more time? Yes, without locking it all the way, like basically as as I don't have it, I never do that because I I understand the, the question. Uh, I just mm-hmm. go like as far as I could go without locking it all the way, and it still does that. You know, as I'm turning, stepping on the gas to to, to come out of the driveway, it keeps on like bumping you know like it's it's wobbling kind of a thing you know what i mean yeah i mean i'm having a hard time really fully understanding the the sensation that you're feeling i guess whether it's a 2014 porsche or in my 2010 toyota pickup i i have a weird noise and they say it's normal so i just said to me show me another one that's doing it let's mm. show me mine yeah, so we should be able to jump in any porsche right now and we can do exactly the same thing and we'll have the same feeling yeah right? yeah so i think they you wouldn't characterize that as a problem but a characteristic of the car so if you could de- if you could have someone demonstrate you know in a non-confrontational way demonstrate to me how you know show me another car just show me how it works but at least you've got it documented early on in the car's life. Next time you take it in for a service, maybe ask them about it again. Talk to the advisor and let them tell you the same story. But at least it's documented. So if something comes up over the next course of, of the life of the car, you may be able to get some help. Or at least it was memorialized from from day one. But I, 
if it's a brand new car, it's probably okay. You know what I hate about auto repair? I hate the broad statements. If it's a broad statement, I'm pretty much not going to count it as true. That's right. a way too broad a statement. I was driving a customer home the other day, and we're driving in his Acura, and he's got 220,000 miles on it. I'm taking back, dropping him off at work. And he says, I was talking to my brother who works for Ford. He's an engineer over there. And he said something about, gave him some advice about transmission service. And he used a big, broad statement, like, don't service transmissions. And, uh, and, and I said, well, it's, that's a broad statement. I hate broad statements. And the reason is your Honda transmission looks absolutely nothing like the inside of a Ford transmission. They're not even on the same spectrum. And you throw a broad statement across all cars. Oh, you know, all Hondas do that. No, no, they don't all do that. So when I'm getting advice about a car, I, I, I don't broad statements. And you're going to talk to people that worked on a car when they were a kid. Or, you know, maybe they started out their career working on cars. But in 10 years, things drastically changed so much. The way we address cars this year is completely different the way we did it 10 years ago. So I'm going to take a lot of that broad statement stuff and just say, it's not accurate. You can't paint it all with one brush, especially coming from uh, maybe the sale. Talk to the salesman that that sold the car and see if they have it. And just, just right. I think the most important thing at this stage of the game is memorialize it. Make sure everybody knows that that you're concerned about it, and, and then it's there for the future. But well, I think you're okay. And congratulations on a nice car too. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm feeling a little car envy. When we come back, looks like we've got Pete and. If I can read that right, I can't see it from here. It's a Camry, Dave. A gentleman in Gilbert. <laughs> and uh, we've got a couple of texts. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. And this is Bumper to Bumper Radio. <laughs> I heard so, every. You, you but... sound so excited today, <laughs> Dave. I mean... Yeah. I need to come over there and slap you around a little bit, I, wake I, you up. I think so. I had, I had a week off, and when I have a week off, I come back, and I'm not really quite sure how the I'm going to throw this work. cup of ice water in your face. Yeah, and uh... that'll, that'll work. Well, actually, we got done talking to Mike Russell this morning. He's hurt because his car is broken down, and he bought it from Whiny. So I think there's a little bit of tension between the two friends because he sold them the car. Oh, Peter <laughs> puts his arms up like big tension. Big tension. So the other <laughs> Mike is the whiner now, not whiny. <laughs> It's Mike and Wine, you have switched roles. So huh? we, I, like to, I like to fuel the fire a little bit. So your friend sent you, sold you a bad car. <laughs> you never sell cars to friends and family because inevitably they do break. It will happen. And it's always going to be one of those things when you're at the backyard barbecue, you know, on, on Memorial Day. You're like, yeah, so I had the uh, Chrysler in the shop the other day. And, uh, you know, it's make, you know. It's just not good. It's almost as bad as working on your neighbor's car. It oh. never goes right. <laughs> so, I mean, I sure hope Michael's Land Cruiser gets fixed. Okay, <laughs> so, speaking of that. Mike but. Henry's car is in the shop at Virginia Auto Service. Uh, so, anyway, we'll see how that comes out. We've got a text here. 2005 Toyota Camry. I'm just going to read through it. It says, when I start my car in the morning, there is a low sound squeal. Got to be first, a belt, right, First Dave? sentence. Yeah, gotta be a belt. it's got to be a belt, right? <laughs> it will go away after my engine has warmed up. That still feels the... Deals the belt thing. And when I will depress my clutch pedal, it will become a little bit more quiet. But once the, the screen re refreshes yeah, as I'm reading it, uh, I depress the pedal, it's louder. Any ideas on what it may be? Well, you've got a pilot bearing in your clutch, and you've got a throwout bearing. It's really called a release bearing, but you've got two bearings in a clutch. The pilot bearing is only working when your clutch pedal is in. When the clutch pedal is out, the pilot bearing is spinning exactly the same speed as the input shaft. As soon as you push the clutch in, the pilot bearing comes to life. So it's going to be either one of those two bearings, the pilot bearing or the throwout bearing. We may have two different squeals. We may have a belt squeal, plus we may have a throwout bearing or release bearing squeal going on. Well, and the way to influence that, that pedal, Dave, I mean, you, we do a lot of clutches as well as you do. But you, you just step on the pedal a little bit. And you don't have to put the pedal down, just a light pressure. Mm -hmm. That'll Not even enough to be able to shift it into gear, but maybe just push down an inch and, you know, it really, and you can almost sometimes feel that back through the pedal if you've yes. got a sensitive foot. I have so. a very sensitive foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. This so is going anyway, downhill. Trying, downhill trying to see what other fast. Text we, got. we had a good text. The guy wanted to know he's got a Chevy truck, a 99 Chevy 3500, the best way to flush the cooling system. 
Well, that car's got Dex cool, and I'm a big believer of putting the right coolant back in the car. It used to be we had green t coolant. Toyota had the same thing as green. It was just red. Chevy came out with Dex cool. That's reddish pink. And those were the three. And, and you used to think, well, if you had red coolant, it was this interval, and green coolant, it was this interval. It doesn't matter. You can't rely on the color of the coolant to help you determine what the interval is. Porsche, Audi, Volkswagen have pink. BMW and Honda have blue. So the point there is I would always stick with what the original equipment coolant is. You can buy the chameleon coolant. I don't mm, like not a, it. Not We're a just fan. Not a big fan of it. Use that. You want to get it, the lower rate. You can rate. tell by tasting it. <laughs> Shut up, Dave. <laughs> you want to pull the radiator hose off, get the radiator empty, maybe pull a heater hose off and run the hose through the engine block and get it all cleaned out, run it back through the heater core and, until you have clean water. Try and blow it out, and then I want to use distilled water to refill that cooling system. At Virginia Auto Service, we have a purified water tank. The water in Phoenix is horrible for your car. You don't need those solids you, yeah, floating around in that thing. Yeah, you don't need that in the cooling system. So we always use a purified you don't want RO water. You need distilled water or a, a DI water. And then you want to get probably a 50-50 mixture. You don't need anything more than 50-50. You certainly, in some cases, you really don't even need 50-50. And use the, use the coolant, but then be careful, too. Some of the coolants are already pre-mixed 50-50. And then no mixing needs to <laughs> Don't happen. mix it, yeah. Well, you need to be aware on these late model cars, if you're doing some stuff in your driveway, little DIY projects, a lot of these late model cars, Volkswagens and such, what's happened is the radiators are now lower than the engine. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to get air pockets out of the system. So we're actually vacuum filling these cooling systems. So it's it, it now is not quite such a driveway job anymore, something you want to mess with. So you can think you're doing a good thing, do a cooling system service, leave a air pocket in there, overheat the thing, warp the head gasket, you know. And uh, so what is it worth? Stick with the right fluid and make sure it's something you want to do. I think on a Chevrolet, I'm, I'm not thinking that's too big of a job. Yeah, 99 Chevy pickup, typically not a big deal. But, uh, you know, yeah, like you said, Dave, these late model cars, the hood lines are down, and, and you've got to be careful to get those burped and bled out. So, you know, Google it. You can always find a lot of stuff on Google, whether it's accurate or not. We don't know, but a lot of people are putting <laughs> tips out there. And Google Gnostics. Find... We're going to go with Pete with a 1999 Corvette. Go ahead, Pete. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning. Say, back in 2005, I got a, uh, a steering column lock recall notice on my uh, Corvette. I took it down to the dealership uh, that same month, and uh, they did whatever they do to, to fix it. But earlier this week, uh, the steering column locked up on it, fortunately, while it was in my garage. So I called the uh, GM dealership uh, down here at Arrowhead, uh, spoke to the service manager, asked him uh, what they could do for me regarding this problem, because I can't even drive the car. And he started talking to me about, uh, well, the uh, warranty is out on it, and and so on and so forth. Well, back in uh, 2005, th there was the, the warranty had already expired on the car. So I'm wondering to myself, well, what's the difference? So I'm just wondering now at this point with this car with only 32,000 miles on it, what would be the obligation of the GM dealership to repair this problem? Well, you know, I don't know. You're right. The car was out of warranty when it had the repair done in 2005, but it was a recall. So that doesn't really have anything to do with the warranty. That's a safety recall, and that's something that, in some cases, maybe know, GM can make up their mind, hey, we're going to voluntarily recall this because we see this being a problem. Or sometimes they're forced recalls. Yeah, yeah, a, a federal government mandated recall. So, so then you have so that's what happened there, and now you have the repair. So they've done the repair, and that repair co probably came with a twelve month, twelve thousand mile warranty. So there may be no obligation from them at all. You might get some better luck, possibly calling. There's probably a toll free number or a customer service number at General Motors to call them and, and maybe get some satisfaction from them. But the problem is, Pete, we still don't know what's wrong with the car. We've got to find out what's wrong. It may have nothing related, maybe a similar symptom, or you, you may be attributing it to the repair that they did, but it very well could be completely 
totally unrelated. So I think you probably just need to get it over there, which can be a challenge. If you can't get it out of the garage because you can't turn the wheel, tow truck, you're going to need a towing company that is good. Uh, and then they're going to have to use a tool called a go jack, probably. It's a little purple roller skates that basically you put underneath the tires of the car. You don't want to let some tow truck meathead monkey that's used to picking up wrecks on the side of the road dragging that car up on the bed you know the wheels are turned and dragging the dragging the tires it's got to go up with some uh some go jack so good low truck meathead junk what what the (laughs) heck is that all about (laughs) hey i i had tow trucks for many years and and there's some uh there's some meatheads out there. You know, there's a magazine called Toe Times. You ever read Toe Times? Yeah. I, I used, love that magazine. I used to get it. Yeehaw, Cooter. <laughs> well, we love to keep you in the know when it comes to auto repair. It, a lot of the old things have changed. It changes every. you got to stay in the know, up to date with what's going on. If you're looking for a great shop to start a relationship with, like Matt's or Dave's, or you can find these shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio. These are great shops that you can go to, have a long relationship with, not have to worry about you being taken advantage of. We'll see you next week.